lot of people here, probably because they're all at the races. Is that right? So racing has been known in Louisville since the late 1700s, but they were racing, as you know, in Market Street, which probably is a little difficult when you have a uh, busy thoroughfare. So there's been a number of courses for horses developed in Louisville since then, but it wasn't until 1872, 1872, that Lewis Clark actually had the idea of developing the Louisville Jockey Club. And Churchill Downs was actually mentioned in newsletters and newspapers in 1883, incorporated as such in 1937, but it wasn't until May 17th of 1875 that 10,000 spectators came together for the first race. And the question is, what was going on in medicine and science around that time, mid to late 1800s? So you should know that on this day in 1857 was the birth of Eugene Bleuler, B-L-E-U-L-E-R, who was a Swiss psychiatrist, very well known for his contributions to understanding a medical, uh, mental illness. And in fact, he coined the term schizophrenia in 1908. In 1878, on this day, Louis Pasteur was talking to the French Academy of Sciences in support of the germ theory of disease. And yet there were a lot of people against this, which he thought was sort of uh, an obstacle to progress in medicine. In 1887, somebody announced the existence of the electron. Somebody announced the electron. Joseph John Thompson was talking to the Rogel Institute Friday evening discourse, uh, and it mentioned that electrons were available. But today we're going to hear about education, if I'm allowed. And you should know that William Henry Welch died on this day in 1934. Who was he? The first dean of Johns Hopkins. And he was an American pathologist who played an important role in what, how we train people today. Uh, he demanded that his students engage in rigorous study of physical um, sciences, but also get actively involved in clinical medicine and have an acting role in laboratory work, all the above. And some of his students were Walter, Walter Reed, James Carroll, Simon Flexer. And Simon, with Simon Flexer, he actually described hysteria toxin. And I want to finish by the fact that today's speaker is an allergist immunologist. So you should know that on this day was the death in 1947 of Sir Amroth Wright. And Sir Amroth Wright was an English bacteriologist and immunologist who actually developed immunization against typhoid fever, which was crucial for British soldiers during World War I. And with that, I leave you with Dr. Tao Lee, Chief of the Section for Allergy and Immunology, who's going to introduce our guest. Morning. I see we're getting a little bit of appropriate derby attire finally. I got my little derby tie, so I think I'm, in, I'm all prepared for the, the festivities coming up this weekend. So it's really my pleasure to introduce today's uh, speaker who has spoken in Grand Rounds previously uh, and is well known to our department. So Dr. Gerald Lee is Assistant Professor and Section Chair of Allergy Immunology in the Department of Pediatrics, so my counterpart. He earned his uh, medical degree at Case Western Reserve University did his med peds residency at uh, St. Vincent's Hospital and Medical Center in New York, and completed his allergy and immunology fellowship at the University of Cincinnati from whence we had recruited him several years. In the handful of years since he has joined our university, Dr. Lee has already become a major education leader within our community and in the nation. He is currently Associate Director of the Pediatric Clerkship and will be the uh, primary director this uh, coming July. Uh, he serves on the Education Program Committee uh, which sets education uh, policy for the School of Medicine. Uh, he is vice chair uh, at the national level. He is vice chair of the CME committee for the American College of Allergy, uh, Asthma, and Immunology, and has been critical in implementing faculty development programs and instructional technologies for multiple national medical societies. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Lee. Hey, can everyone hear me? Hi, good morning everybody. Tao, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, so it's uh, really exciting to talk on Derby Week. Um, I think, you know, my goal of this presentation is, you know, we all are great clinicians, but we're all here in academics to be educators as well. And as we think about how best to train our students, residents, and our colleagues, um, you know, we had a 
explosion of different tools available, um, and especially some of the educational tech technologies that's come out, at least in the last year to decade, um, has given us a vast array of tools we can use. And so I think what I'd like to, to give you by the end of this presentation is some things to experiment with. Um, nothing in this presentation is going to change the way you approach teaching. Certainly the same goals you do to design an educational program to reach certain learning objectives, those things are not changed by this talk. But hopefully you have ideas where you can achieve those goals with some new, uh, uh, new tools, new things to play with, all right? Um, as you can see, uh, I'm gonna try to demo a lot of uh, things that uh, require a little interactivity. I hope most of you brought your mobile devices. If you did, uh, I have the uh, code for the guest wireless here. Um, it's a little dark, but there is a uh, version here once I start uh, with the presentation. So with fur without further ado, let me switch to the presentation. Give me one second. So, oh goodness gracious, this doesn't work at the VA. Oh my goodness. Oh no, no, I, this, these two things. Oh, this, this remote does not. I did not know that. I apologize. I, I did not know that. All right. So, uh, first I'd like to, oops. Oh, my goodness. Ah, hold a second. That is not a good start, is it? start at the beginning. Let's start with the disclosure side. So, uh, my disclosure would be first that I'm presenting a lot of different tools, but I actually have no financial relationship with any of them. I think these are just things I thought were very interesting. Um, you know, in terms of the learning objectives, again, I, I, some of the things I'd like for us to take home with is some sort of overview of how we got here and the use of educational technologies and what is the evidence or the theory behind it, right? And so I'll we'll present a little bit about the psychological research by Dr. Meyer regarding that and then uh, demos. I think just sort of having a little bit of fun. And, and so we focus this talk mainly on cheap, easy learning tools. There's one tool that actually is a little expensive um, that I just couldn't, I couldn't help but show off, but I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, I won't be reviewing the Paris Simulation Center. I think we're all aware that there's multiple faculty members who have been involved in simulation. I think simulation in itself is its own topic. You could spend a whole half day on simulation. I think many of these things are intended for the single practitioner with not requiring a lot of uh, uh, resources, you know, with your own sort of devices and computers. And hopefully, uh, we'll have time for questions. So um, if you have your device, like, again, uh, uh, you can take a photo of this if you want, or you know, this could be emailed out to, uh, afterward to the talk. This is where we'll be hosting. So you know, if, you know, if you missed something or you want to look back, you can either go to this website, this little uh, UofL Ed Tech uh, URL shortener I used, or again, you could obviously email me. So where, how we got here? What has happened um, in terms of the realm of educational technology? If you think about technology, right, a, a tool used to, to uh, again, uh, uh, to educate or so on, we could think that it started with chalkboard. That's in the 19th century. That's a technology, right? Uh, a reusable uh, board that uses kind of a, a surface that can be applied with multiple teachers and learners, right? That's a technology. And so certainly uh, another technology is uh, the slide projector. You know, here is a 1925 advertisement. You could see right now what some of the advertisements are doing where you're talking about more effectiveness and with this brilliant projector with vivid images and, and so on, right? 
Um, the, what is the best teaching aid since the chalkboard? It is the, the overhead projector, right? We all remember the overhead projector, of course. Uh, uh, I, I would say we had a, a microbiology professor who was using that as, as recently as three, three years ago, still communicated what he needed to. But it's really with the uh, advent of the personal computer in the 1970s that we've sort of seen a ex, uh, great acceleration of the variety of ways and tools sort of exponentially grow. And I think that was concurrent to the 1990s where there was uh, dissemination and availability of the internet. And I, I think the 1990s is particularly significant because we think about it, if the average age of a medical student is about 24 years of age, that means current matriculating students were born after wide dissemination of the internet, all right? So this is a generation of learners that have been immersed in technology, and so that not only sets up expectations, but also sets up their uh, acumen and their interest in utilizing these, these techniques as well. So what do we know about the dissemination of technology uh, in the modern era? Well, we know exactly, yes, we know that there are more people who have a mobile phone than a toothbrush. My goodness, that is incredible. Certainly, we know that this all started with mobile devices with the BlackBerry. The BlackBerry actually came out in 1999, 16 years ago. But it, uh, I, I think most of us have some sort of smartphone able to exist, uh, either the iPhone or the Android system. Uh, the Windows phone is another one. And really, uh, that's expanded to not only a mobile phone, but now a tablet-sized device, a more portable personal computer that actually is much more powerful than the personal computers in the 1970s. And, and so when we think about dissemination of, of these technologies that have occurred over time, a survey done in 2012, okay, so this was done in 2012, showed that 93% of healthcare professionals, including students, have a smartphone or tablet uh, mobile device. So who in this audience does not have a smartphone? Please raise your hand. All right, we have one person. So that is 98% penetration instead of 93% penetration, all right? So again, that number probably continues to grow. And so now we have babies born with it at birth. And you know, now they say, hey, they can text their, their, <laughs> their kids, hey, I was born, all right? Oh my God, OMG. So what, what can we do with these devices? Well, we can do e-learning, electronic learning. Learning that is accomplished with some sort of uh, computer, smartphone, or tablet. So, you know, I kind of showed you, you know, every new technology advertises something, right? They even said, the best thing since the chalkboard, the best thing since the you know, transparency slide projector. What is so unique about e-learning that would beat chalk or anything else like, uh, and so on. So you know, we've sort of, uh, uh, this has been published basically by Rich Mayer's work. Uh, some of the things he proposes is number one is, again, even greater power for editing and uh, updating, you know, when you have a textbook that's out of paper and new knowledge is disseminated, that textbook has to be rewritten. If you have an e-textbook, they revise it on the fly, right? So instantly updated, keeping up with the rapid pace of medical innovations. Number two is obviously dissemination, right? To get a paper book or you know physical uh, object, you have to go to the library. You have to go to that classroom. Electronic media is able to be disseminated large, large distances and asynchronously, meaning um, there are many lectures in the School of Medicine where the majority of students see them online instead of in the lecture hall because of the power of them doing it on their own time, own convenience, own setting. And multimedia, right? Uh, we do recognize the power of multimedia to disseminate information where we can integrate uh, chest x-rays, we can uh, put in, you know, uh, 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 pathological breath sounds with video, audio, 
that sort of thing, right? I'll just, we'll skip that. And then finally, what I like as the educator is the ability for data analysis. So, for example, we have ExamSoft. So ExamSoft is uh, disseminated uh, through the university as a way to do testing, but then the computer automatically gives us the percentage correct. It gives us the statistics, what, what uh, questions are, uh, have high uh, discriminatory values, so which ones are confusing and actually maybe should be thrown out. And that instantaneously clues in the educator by subject matter, if you tag correctly, how to modify your curriculum to, to again, to meet, uh, again, gaps in learning from your assessment to really know how well am I doing. Again, we've done all these things before, but technology has broadened our ability to make it easier and more accessible. How does this work? I mean, I mean, I kind of told you these things, but what is the evidence? Well, uh, I think what the most often uh, paper on this was done by David Cook in the Mayo Clinic. And David Cook looked at multiple internet-based learning interventions in a meta-analysis, and you could see that internet-based learning beats no intervention. Now that's a pretty silly study, you know. <laughs> Some learning is better than no learning. Right? I mean, okay, so what, what are we most interested in? Does internet-based learning have a particular value over the chalkboard, over just talking in a room? Actually, it does not. There is actually no statistical significant benefit overall to knowledge gain with internet-based learning. Why? Because it is not in itself inherently better it is a tool just like everything else I've presented you in the past. So I think that is one take home point I would like to mention. Like everything I'm taking about technology, the tool itself is not how you design the course. You design the course and you exploit the best tools available that match your learning objectives. And so what particular features of e-learning are particularly uh, advantageous if you wanted to do some sort of uh, curricular design? Well, again, David Cook in a follow uh, analysis found that the most, uh, most learning outcomes were best affected when you did uh, activities that uh, invoke interactivity, practice exercises, repetition, and feedback on progress, all right? So you want to design something where you are engaging the audience, the audience gets feedback about their performance, and they have an opportunity to continue to practice skills over time, right? And certainly the electronic platform does make some of those activities easier. And I'll show you some examples of how uh, students can get feedback uh, and so on. So again, the big theme here is that think of technology as the toolbox, but you really need the blueprint to, as your starting point before you head toward utilizing technology. There's multiple models to develop an instructional design blueprint. I, I think the most uh, common one that's cited is the ADDI model, right? ADDI has uh, five components in the uh, acronym. Uh, first, what do they need to know? So use previous, you know, uh, scores in the past. Uh, maybe basically assess your learner's knowledge gaps by asking them. Maybe they might be self-reflective. And based on that, you're going to design specific learning objectives that's going to address that need, right? And then think of your strategy. Your strategy of what you want to teach is based on what they need. If it's a procedural skill, then maybe you need to do simulation. Is it knowledge-based? Then maybe, yeah, maybe the multiple choice questions work. I mean, it's really tailored to what you're trying to teach. And that's how you develop your content and your uh, platform to address those needs. Now, once you do that, you will implement it either online or, you know, again, uh, again, or maybe just in the classroom, whatever you think is most appropriate, the sim lab. But again, to convince yourself that you made an impact, it built into it, you should do some sort of assessment and then, again, we do the cycle of continuous improvement by, again, revising our current curriculum based on prior performance. So again, that, I cannot uh, emphasize the importance that it is a tool not in itself uh, a way to teach. 
right? Because actually, think, if you think about it, that's going to limit what you're going to do. If you're going to, oh, we're just going to use this, you may be missing the big picture on how best to accomplish your learning goals. Okay, so I told you that multimedia is a major part of what makes educational technology unique and actually advantageous. So what do we know about multimedia learning theory? Again, I'm quoting a lot from Dr. Meyer's work. First, uh, constructive learning theory states that uh, certain, pe uh, certain people learn through experiential work and feedback, all right? So again, uh, constructivist belief that you should provide students experiences to make their own, uh, again, opportunities to kind of throw themselves out there, make mistakes, get feedback on it, get better. And again, not spoon feed them, but uh, again, provide them kind of uh, these sort of uh, interactive activities. Dual coding theory I'll talk about in a little bit. Cognitive load. Cognitive load, remember that everyone has a certain capacity to absorb knowledge. So whenever designing a learning activity, even with technology, you know, there is a temptation to put in everything. Really, whenever designing an activity, what do you want them to walk away with at the end of the talk? And so cognitive load theory cautions against overwhelming someone with an excessive amount of pictures, videos, and that sort of thing. So let's talk about dual coding. Dual coding states that we actually learn through two different channels. One is actually verbal, so what I'm telling you, and one is actually visual, which is what you are seeing. So let's say I showed you a whole bunch of words, and then I read it out to you, right? The dual, uh, uh, the dual, uh, cognitive uh, theory of dual coding states that you are only overloading the verbal channel and I'm not engaging words whatsoever. So if you compare educational interventions that use pictures and someone talks over it versus just showing out the steps and words and just reading it out to you, you can learn more if you engage mo both channels simultaneously. And then the, we automatically integrate that information and therefore, we have a receptive to actually uh, local, uh, I'm sorry, absorbing more information by utilizing both data streams versus overloading one channel. So again, the, the take home message for multimedia learning theory is that you want to engage both channels. You want to show a figure, but also talk over it instead of just, just reading words or just showing pictures and again, without doing a uh, verbal or auditory component. So I'm gonna, okay, good, okay. So I'm on time, good. So hopefully I'll spend the next 20 minutes or 30 minutes ago talking about some of these tools and then hopefully we'll have time for questions. So I think we're gonna start very sort of familiar and then we'll kind of go into some more interesting uh, applications. Okay, so let's talk about slide authoring. So slide authoring, we're very familiar with it. PowerPoint is used, you know, pretty much uh, like uh, by every single educator. Uh, if not, then, you know, Keynote or some of the other platforms. And, you know, we know based on multimedia, multimedia learning theory, what are the best practices for PowerPoint? So what are those? Well, I think I told you that you really want to take the balance away from text and bullets and try to utilize both channels by mixing uh, pictures that's, and words that's, that uh, link to the pictures. You want to have that concordance and, again, ba engage both channels, both the word channel and the visual channel. Um, and why, you know, you know, why would you want to do that? You know, why not we just throw up uh, kind of text and bullets? Well, it, there is a, you know, there is <laughs> this perception that when you engage, you know, when you engage both channels, it is interesting. You know, visual images are more interesting to audiences. That certainly that will engage them, and so they don't basically fall asleep. Uh, I've been here, you know, and. You know, how you can do that is you, you avoid some of these sort of pitfalls. So you don't want to use kind of bright colors. You want to try to keep something maybe like a light background with dark text or blue and, uh, and so on, a um, single, single color. Um, obviously, you know, unusual colors like orange can be a little distracting. Um, again, you don't want to overwhelm them. Remember, oh, this is overla overloading the verbal channel, right? There's just too many words uh, on the page. And again, this person was well-intentioned to put text 
and pictures together, but do they concord? Or are they just throwing up pictures there just to do it, right? Make sure they link together somehow. And you're actually supporting what you're trying to do uh, that rather than putting something cute, right? And then this is a famous Department of Defense uh, picture. I think this is, I, I don't even know, uh, I don't even know <laughs> what was the purpose of this. But again, they did a good job. They obviously spent a lot of time on it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's say you want to try another slide authoring software. All right. So, um, what are the alternatives? Well, as you can see, I'm using Prezi. Prezi is an online um, presentation software that uses spatial rearrangement to organize topics. It kind of lumps together. Um, Haiku Deck and Emaze utilize the same uh, sort of philosophy, maybe not through motion, but with a large emphasis on graphics. Actually, the software forces you to utilize graphics and train you not to use words. It's very interesting. They're just, it's sort of like psychologically trying to break the cycle of bullet points. You know what I mean? And, and so, you know, what is the benefits of that? Well, again, if you talk about Prezi, Prezi is a very uh, kinetic, uh, visual style. Um, it, again, it, it's very flowing. It is very, very picture-oriented. Prezi, again, is one of those platforms does, that does encourage you to use graphics and spatially arrange things so we sort of see how we're presenting something in, in a larger context. But of course, if you want to use text, you can. I mean, you know, if you, if you really wanted to. Now, again, if you take this and you're like, okay, well, obviously you can see that cytokines will go through the JAK-STAT pathway and, and induce gene regulation, you're going to like, you know, what? You know, you're, you'll be like a little lost. So can you use this kind of motion to direct your audience's attention to say that, yes, I want to tell you that IL-4 will engage the IL-4 receptor, work through the JAK-STAT pathway, which will translocate to the nucleus and induce gene transcription of pro-allergic genes. You know, you can accomplish that in a very easy to, uh, better to follow, uh, I mean, I probably wouldn't use this busy side, I'm sorry, but you know, you, you can present it in a way that makes more sense and they, so they see the big picture and where you want to focus your audience's attention. Certainly this is online. Everything I'm doing right now is online. I did download it because I'm paranoid the Wi-Fi is going to crash and burn. But again, uh, this is completely online. I, you can disseminate anywhere. You guys, I gave you the link to this. You could see my presentation, you know. And, and so, um, it, again, it has the advantages of dissemination of knowledge. And then again, videos, text, all these things are possible when you use these kind of uh, uh, platforms that encourage multimedia learning. And it's free. So free is good. You have to play for PowerPoint. Well, actually, you know, everyone gets it through their institution. But you don't, this is actually without cost. So there is always a downside to everything. Let's just sort of, this is what's the reality check of, of using any of these other slide authoring path platforms. Is that it takes a while to learn. Um, I, I think that, you know, we're, we're very busy people. And, you know, we try to, again, you know, do what you know, do what we want to do to teach well. But you know, sometimes that extra investment you have to a lot in advance. Uh, certainly, uh, I told you if the internet breaks, you're in big trouble. So that's why I have a PDF version, and I got uh, you know the app version. I got you know, there's actually a paper version I got here. <laughs> and then uh, you know, some people, I would say a certain percentage of people, do get very dizzy with Prezi. I, I think that, I think every single presentation I've done, someone's kind of come up to me and gotten a little nauseous. So again, you have to, you have to kind of minimize, uh, again, the, the uh, large uh, sweeping gestures. I've tried to do that. I still think I'm continuing to refine this presentation to make it less um, uh, dizzying. But again, time. Time is the big, big investment here, okay? So what are some kind of PowerPoint plus sort of things? Things that enhance your existing PowerPoint slides. How can you enrich them? Because you put a lot of work into them. You don't want to throw it away. How can we make it even better? Well, you know, there are various different ways to teach an old dog new tricks. You can basically use audience response. I think we've seen a fair number of people use audience response already. One of the most popular 
uh, platforms historically in the medical school was iClickers, but that requires a investment of buying the physical clicker. But we all has a physical clicker now. It is your cell phone. Everyone has their cell phone. It is a clicker, right? And so we have different platforms. One of them is Pull Everywhere. Uh, that's one of them I'm going to be sh uh, demonstrating uh, in a little bit. I was going to show you every slide, but the website broke this morning, Cal. So I was like, that kind of wasn't good. And then, and then they went out of business for a while, and they came back. And it was kind of weird. I don't know what happened. OK, I'm going to probably take this out. It's not reliable, right? Um, Cal introduced me to uh, Pear Deck very recently. They allow uh, drawing on the slide. They actually have different polling options. Um, I, I didn't have a time to build a Pear Deck sort of thing. But this is my favorite one, all right? Um, so Kahoot um, is a audience response platform that resembles bar trivia. I don't know if you've ever done bar trivia. But basically, it's sort of thing where you get points if you answer the question correctly and you cr answer it quickly, all right? So I will show you both uh, uh, Poll Everywhere and the bar trivia one, because I think those are my two favorites. So let's start with Poll Everywhere. So for example, we know all know mobile choice uh, questions. That's not very interesting. But to use uh, Poll Everywhere, what you're going to need to do is you're going to want to go to this website here. It's pollev.com. You type my first and last name, Gerald Lee, 444. And then answer with one question, what is your favorite derby activity. So again, this is not where I'm telling them what the answer is. I'm not um, you know, giving them an A, B, C, D, but I'm allowing a free form discussion in an audience in order to, you know, again, get a wide variety of responses. And as an educator, I find that very useful. I mean, I really, you really want to convince yourself during a talk, are people with you? Are we losing some people? Or you know, we want to have an interactive discussion, and we want to be inclusive, but in a large group, that may not be logistically possible. So using word clouds, using sort of free text responses allows you, I'm sorry, I forgot the VA thing, <laughs> allows you to, um, to engage your audience, right? So some people like to drink booze. <laughs> uh, they like the hot air balloons. And the air show, I think. I think I don't know if it meant the air show. Thunder, thunder is fantastic, right? And and so you know the bigger, boy, drinking is winning. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, so it's a tie between thunder and drinking. <laughs> but interesting. So what do we've learned? We have a wide variety of responses. We know what is the majority opinion. And as an educator, I am inclusive. I'm not giving them the answer, but I'm also engaging a wide variety. And we see we all can participate in the conversation. It's a conversation starter, all right? Oh, my goodness. What happened to drinking? Oh, betting. OK. Yeah, I was one. I was like, where's betting? All right, let's do one more. So another one is um, another activity you can do is actually interacting with pictures and, and um, uh, images. So. Imagine, so I'm going to do this one, which is, where were you born? And you know, this could be an x-ray. This could be uh, a pathway where you want to ask someone what's the critical blocking step for you know, uh, you know, uh, matinib or something like that. And oh goodness, is it working? Or should I do it? Oh, you have to register this one? Oh, that's a bummer. I'm sorry. This was this used to be on every slide, but then it broke. So I was going to use Pull Everywhere's version. So that's not working, huh? All right. Okay, that's no. Or am I am I hiding it? No. You got to log into that one. Okay, I'm sorry. This was a last minute thing because the pull over, I mean, the every slide thing broke, and I, I usually use that one. I'm sorry about that. But, anyways, you, you get the idea, right? There is um, the ability to interact with a, a photo and, and, again, and do that. All right, so let's do the next one. So, for the next one, give me one second. Um, 
is bar trivia. Bar trivia is definitely my favorite one. All right, so to do this, um, what you're going to need to do, and I'm going to start it first here. And so it's called Kahoot. So whip out your mobile device, and I want you to go to this website, kahoot.it, and put in this game pin. And then I'm going to be working on something while you do that. So Kahoot is bar trivia. You'll be presented five questions centered on derby trivia. The faster you respond, the more points you get, but you have to be accurate. The winner should see me after the talk. You can get this 2015 commemorative Kentucky Derby mug to fuel your clinical activity with caffeine. All right? So, uh-oh, nickname. Okay, so the nickname, we're going to trust we know who it is. You're going to have to come back to me. All right. How many people can we get in here? Okay, we'll probably wait another minute or so. So anyways, uh, when I was buying this, the, the lady said, this one actually looks reasonable. I guess she didn't like the 3D ones or the other ones. So again, apparently this one, th today's, uh, this year's design is a U of L uh, grad who, uh, again, uh, I, I, I forgot her name already. I apologize. All right, we got 48. Okay, let's go. Okay, remember, speed, people, speed. <clears throat> what was the first Kentucky Derby? Dr. Roman just said it. Just said it. <laughs> oh, are we missing somebody? I gave 30 seconds just in case, but... Uh... Usually it stops when everyone's in, so if you have not voted. All right, the correct answer is 1875. 27 got that correct. Oh, I have to do the next. And Neil is in the lead. All right, who won 2014 last year? Who was the winner of last year's Kentucky Derby? California Chrome, that is correct. 32, got that correct. Wow, on fire, but it's close. No, listen, 50 points, that's like a millisecond, all right? So it is still close. This is like our own little derby here, if you think about it, right? Okay, which horse holds the record for the fastest time in the Kentucky Derby? It's been held for years, decades, decades. Oh, don't think too hard. <laughs> All right, so it looks like this is going to go out of time. It is Secretariat. Yes. Everyone knew that one, I guess. Okay. Right, let's ask harder ones. Wow. You see how quickly it can change? Let me tell you something. It's close. That mug. Okay. There was a derby champion that actually was disqualified for poor performance enhancing drugs. It was an anti-inflammatory, but now it's legal. So that's a bummer. Who was that? Dancer's image. Oh, wow. That was close. That was close. Okay, I think this is question five is the last one. All right. This, it can change at any moment, folks. It can change at any moment. 
There was a Preakness and Belmont State winner that did not race the, uh, the Ducky Birdie, very famous horse. Which of the following four raced and won both the Preakness and the Belmont, but did not even participate, didn't even participate in the Kentucky Derby? Correct answer is Man of War. Okay, so that was a tough one. So I guess we're all waiting. Drum roll, please. For the so AR, could AR stand up, please? In the audience, a remote is that VA? The, oh yes, everybody. Do you want it now? Here, just come up. Come up now. Everyone gives a round. Of, all right, there you go. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. All right. Okay, so. Let me tell you, medical professionals are very competitive. I can't tell you how engaged I can get students once stuff is on the line. I'm, I'm not, I'm poor, you know, Starbucks gift card, but you know what I mean, it, you get the idea, all right? Um, now I have to figure out what my talk is. <laughs> where am I? <laughs> oh, goodness gracious, where am I? So, you get the idea. Uh, SlideShare, again, we're going to put it online so it's available for everybody. Uh, so webinars. So, you know, we think of webinars as something we sign up for, but you can actually make your own. Um, again, this is basically the idea of using an electronic medium to disseminate long distances not separated by space. You can give a lecture to the whole country, the whole world, if you give someone the link. It's recorded. You can... It's enduring content. And all the audience response stuff I'm talking about, I mean, I, I skip multiple choice, but multiple choice is usually available and that sort of thing. It works in multiple mobile devices. Um, I think GoToWebinar we've used the most. That does have incur a cost. Any meeting is free. Any meeting is free. I would suggest that if you just like to do it on your own and you, you know, and you'll want to invest the money or you have a small group, I would definitely uh, sign up for any meeting. They'll just do it for you. Um, again, you'll get this kind of uh, dashboard here. I, this slide was uh, uh, borrowed from Tao, where basically uh, your attendings will hear. You can interact by chat. You can actually, uh, again, uh, show your screen or give it to someone else. You can create polls. You can um, answer questions. Usually that's done on the back end, and then the moderator will, uh, again, elicit questions to the, the speaker. Um, and basically, uh, it's very interactive present, uh, presentations that, again, you know, we can do grand rounds in, in an interactive session to the entire country, um, and so on. So, obviously, uh, there's a little bit of difference when you are in the online environment. You probably do want to project well. You want to test, beta test the system. Certainly, you do need to invest in a good microphone or headset. Um, certainly, I think you do want to meet in advance. Um, you're going to need to have admitted probably moderators and speakers. I probably would not recommend doing it by yourself. Um, probably you're going to need a, like a co-pilot to field questions and again work on issues. Um, and then remember engagement, right? Interactivity is a strong feature of uh, high high quality multimedia learning. So utilize all these interactive techniques by polling the audience, Q&As, doing multiple choice questions, reviewing the polls, discussions, that sort of thing. Uh, screen recording, I don't think I have enough time to, to review a demo for you, but basically, um, you know, I can certainly record the audience and, and um, uh, do it just on my tablet and video. There's a couple apps for this that, uh, again, you can save. You can, again, demonstrate a procedure or give a talk or, uh, again, uh, uh, project that. Uh, there are two, two uh, um, platforms that are available. Snagit is one of them. The other one is Screener. Uh, and again, these are uh, all going to be in the talk later. I'm sorry, I'm just, I realize I took a little, bit, a little bit too much time, so I'm just going to move on a little bit. Let's talk about video sharing. Now, video sharing, I feel like I'm talking, uh, preaching to the choir because actually, the Department of Medicine is actually ahead of the game in terms of video sharing. 
Uh, as you know, we can create video content and post it online. Uh, and obviously, one of the most popular services is YouTube. There's other ones like um, the Vimeo and, and so on. But I guess you guys are already doing that. I mean, uh, you guys, are, uh, the Louisville Lecture Series, kind of uh, Laura Bishop is one of the participants uh, who's a MedPeach resident, has developed lecture series where, again, that's free open access medical education that, again, has raised the, our prominence as a center of medical education. And again, people all over the world can see lectures done here in our institution and get the benefit from it. And so obviously I, I feel kind of like you guys are already, uh, we're already doing this. Obviously I think we could do that in PEDS as well. Um, but I want to show you one thing is, is that yes, you can have video, but what about that interactivity you get with, with video lectures, can we sort of still get that? And so Educanon is one way to take your existing YouTube videos and uh, make them interactive. So this is a talk I gave like two years ago that was I saw on YouTube, because they asked me, can I put our, your previous Wednesday didactics on YouTube? I'm like, yeah, but then I had audience response in it, right? So can people still get the benefit? Sure, so you know, here's, here's me. I told you it was coming. So, you were concerned about anaphylaxis. It's a young woman, I apologize. You're gonna do that rapid assessment. What are the findings you think is not relevant to anaphylaxis? Runny nose, vomiting, itching, or flushing, or all of the above is consistent. Go ahead. Now, if you were watching this video, you couldn't do anything. But again, if you put into the system, the person who watched your video can still interact with the poll and get feedback on their answers, all right? So, so uh, again, again, you get feedback, right? So you can still utilize some of the advantages that you're trying to do in interactivity, even to people you've never met before by putting on certain platforms that engage uh, audience participation. Um, I always get lost which tab I'm in. All right. <clears throat> so that's Educanon. All right, so let's get to Oh wait, we, okay, so we talked about live real casting, so we'll, we'll, we'll have to skip that. All right, so let's talk about mobile apps. So mobile apps are basically where, uh, you know, we have these little devices, they're mini computers. Do we have different ways to, again, utilize them and create, uh, and, and utilize educational content for ed education? They're obviously, uh, you know, usually priced lower than uh, products you buy on a computer. I have a couple apps I like to sh show off. One of them is explain everything. And so in order to do that, I'm gonna need to switch up my, uh, my devices here. And so while, while I'm doing that, I'm gonna talk while we do this. And so basically explain everything is basically a, a, a platform where you can use drawing and other uh, sort of, uh, you, know, the, you know, utilize the advantages of the tablet in order to you know, uh, do uh, education in the classroom. So let's say you wanted to talk about asthma. As you're lecturing, you could do an electronic whiteboard of sorts and supplement your lecture. So the way I would do that is if I can engage my little mirroring thing because I tried to do the online one, but I don't have, again, my Apple TV working, but that doesn't mean I can't do this. All right, so here is my, this is my iPad here. And so we're just gonna open that up right now. Oh, I have to click this. <laughs> All right, so again, this is, let's say I was talking about type one hypersensitivity, right? And you know what, I wanna record this. I wanna make sure that I save it, so I'm gonna record that, right? And then so I'm, I'm lecturing the audience, it's recording video, I would say, okay, so type one hypersensitivity, this is from the mast cell, we know it's IgE mediated, the, media, the, the major effector is histamine, right? We could do type two is antibody mediated, right? What's an example of that one? Well, we could say that this one is, uh, you know, ITP or something like that, or drug-induced, uh, you know, um, thrombocytopenia, you know, this is, you know, contact germ, right? So you know we can we can do whatever we want to, and and utilize you know the chalkboard on the tablet using different photos and again you know being responsive to what the needs of the audience is um, 
if you ask me what I just did in terms of mirroring this onto the screen, I actually used QuickTime. So um, this, uh, your, your QuickTime player, if you go up here and you say new movie recording, I can select the input. And so the input I selected was my iPad here. I said Jerry pad because that's my pad. But you know, you can, um, you can mirror any of your devices. Uh, the cord is the cheapest way to do it. If you invest in a, in a software called Reflector, I, I think I have that later in the talk, you can do it wirelessly, but it depends on your Wi-Fi connection. So this one, I tried it and it blocked me, but um, the backup plan, and that's why I have this ridiculously long lightning cable, um, is you just a direct connected directly through USB. So, and, it, and that, that's, I mean, everyone has a lightning cable, right? Because you have to charge the darn thing. So, you know, um, you know, that's how we can utilize that. Uh, what, what are some, actually, while I'm in here, I got some other stuff. Let's just, let's just kind of futz around here. What do I got in here? All right. So I, you know, very interested in, you know, okay, I got a feedback. You know, technology is great, but I weep for the loss of the physical exam, right? I mean, you know, if you're focusing on technology, you're losing the physical exam. Well, I would argue if you really want to teach the physical exam, use technology to teach the physical exam. So what examples do we have of that? Well, you have imagery. So figure one is like the Instagram for physicians. You may have seen this advertised. So figure one basically is other physicians who upload photos of interesting clinical findings. It's like New England Journal of Medicine, picture of the day, JAMA uh, image challenge, except this is actually kind of crowdsourced from different physicians. So here are the allergy immunology pictures that are near and dear to my heart, and they have to be online because I just got disconnected from the Wi-Fi. Whoops. Um, I don't know if I have time to do that. But, uh, you know, essentially, uh, you know, that's one, uh, you know, that's one way to, again, use imagery in order to, again, uh, show physical exam findings and supplement your, your, your education of students. All right, so I'm not sure I have time to put in the password, so we'll just do that later. Um, this is the Lemon um, Heart Sounds app. It's completely free. You just download it. If you wanted to learn about, you know, uh, fix play the heart sound, you could easily just, you know, play you know, you could have the visual aspect, or I don't know if it's muted. It's probably muted, but um, you know, you could you, you know you could play the the full sounds. Okay, it's not it's not playing right now, but uh, you know, again, you can if I connected the the sound to this into a speaker, you can again display that sound to a classroom and and utilize that. Um, I think one other thing for the physical exam I'd like to demonstrate is actually it does cost an investment, but I just thought it was so neat that I just wanted to, to show you. So as you know, um, runny noses is my business. I'm an allergist by trade, right? And so uh, I recently encountered this, uh, uh, this device here, and I'm, I'm probably going to skip, skip to that slide. Um, where is it? Yeah, so I've, I encountered this device here, um, and it's called the cell scope. So the cell scope is basically a otoscope that uh, connects to your cell phone. So basically, the way it works is that you actually have to get a case for it, but it connects like this, and it actually can, uses the camera and your light to project images. And so let me demo that, and I, I guess um, I asked for a volunteer. I don't know if that's still okay. So <laughs> Jesse has a, gladly volunteered. By the way, I was number 12 on your test. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> okay, first let me get it. Let me get it queued up here. So, give me one second. This means that only you can evaluate only once a year per day. All righty. And then Mona, Mona is being very kind to me right now. All righty. Oh, is it? Oh, now everyone knows my password. Oh, well, that's not good. Whoops. <laughs> All right. So, again, it'll look like this. So I got to select an ear. I guess we'll start with the left. Um, and so that is the image, right? So we can see it, right? May I? Yes, go ahead. All right. Can I look? Of course. So we can take a look here, and you can see 
gray, pearly, nice looking eardrum, your chairman does listen to the concerns of the department. And I have proved it to all of you. <laughs> all right. It can be saved. It can be uh, used for teaching. You can show trends over time. I had a patient who came in who had severe allergic rhinitis. I started her on therapy. Came, she came back for follow-up. It shrunk. I showed it to her. Convinced me, convinced her. The therapy is working. All right? Very powerful for student education. Very powerful for patient education. I think it's really cool. Uh, $300 retail. If you want the coupon code, I'll give it to you. By the way, I got that randomly from Google, by the way. I don't know. I don't know if it's going to close soon. All righty. So I think I've been jumping ahead. It's like five minutes to go. I'm sorry I cut the, the presentation short because I just wanted to show you the cool stuff. But the bottom line is this. The bottom line is that if you wanted to think about what general principles of using technology in medical education, what would I tell you? Well, first... You want to just kind of do one thing at a time, right? Really get to know it, play around with it, experiment, right? But, you know, just, you know, if you got your talk coming up next week, I would probably say it's not wise to implement it at that time. You probably want to at least familiarize it and, and work with it a little bit. Remember, technology is not your centerpiece. Your learning objective is the centerpiece of your talk. Use technology to support it and then use it as a tool just like you use the stethoscope, just like you use the otoscope or the cellscope, you're going to use, you know, your uh, computers, these web device, you know, web-enabled uh, uh, programs in order to enrich the fundamental uh, learning objective you're trying to address according to your students' needs. Certainly you want to practice. Check out the menu. Uh, you know, you can attest that... Uh, Jason can tell, can tell you, I was all over the place. I was like double checking everything three times. There was like backup to the backup to the backup, right? And then glitches. So this was relatively glitch free, except I lost Wi Fi on my iPad, but otherwise it, it went pretty well. So that was, that was, but again, this, I've, I had disaster presentations, so I'm glad this one I didn't embarrass myself too, too bad uh, today. All right, so I think we're going to have five minutes for questions. I'd love to take them if you have any. <clears throat> Thank you, Jerry. That, that was really interesting when we finished through my lecture. <laughs> uh, listen, I, I had a question for you. Somebody, this presentation reminded me of a conversation I had with my wife last week. And we were talking about the change in academic centers, the changes in education, changes in technology, and all these things that were really moving faster than what Jesse Roman could move. Okay? And after I'm talking, having this conversation, she stops me and looks at me and says, are you saying you're becoming a dinosaur? Okay. And so that's why the name I used up there was Dino. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you a question that might seem like it comes from a dinosaur, but that many people in this room are thinking of. And that is the people of, when I train, the main concern they have about technology is that there's two differences about technology. One is that it's extremely helpful to deliver knowledge, but is it equally helpful to deliver empathy, service, culture, interest, passion, analytical ability? Uh, because many would argue that I don't need to memorize something anymore. I could memorize it all here. But what I do need to have is a sense of urgency. How do I search this? How do I apply it? And the same thing, if you're a researcher, the same thing. It doesn't matter if I have an RT-PCR machine. If I don't know what I need to evaluate RNA and how to do it, how to apply it to the scientific method, it is irrelevant. Is there something about the use of technology that is inherent to technology that advances that in the brain? Or can we use technology to also advance those processes instead of just delivering knowledge? So, so if the question is, can you use technology for non-cognitive learning objectives, there you go. then the, the, the answer is an emphatic yes, absolutely, all right? And it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be the latest thing. But what are you trying to do, right? You are trying 
to accomplish a certain learning objective, and you're trying to figure out the best tools to address it, right? Certainly, some of the examples we can think of, like, you know, looking up stuff on the phone, yes, of course those are not platforms to address, you know, communication skills and empathy. But let's say you had a patient story. Let's say you invited a patient on a webinar that could, it was too sick to come to the auditorium, but through an online connection, they can communicate and engage someone, right? So really, what are you trying to do? And then, you know, I showed you just a slice of all the things available. You can pick a techno technological uh, uh, tool to achieve non cognitive learning objectives just as long as it's appropriate for the tool. Certainly PowerPoint doesn't make people touchy-feely. I mean, you can try to, but again, you won't really want to engage some of these other sort of things. Simulation, again, can get your heart racing and that sort of thing. You know, so there's different ways to, to utilize the correct tool for the correct learning objectives. Yeah, so again, I think they're, knowing your audience is immensely important. I, I can tell you some of the criticisms that have levied to me uh, in the past. I think I did tell you that certain of the kinetic sort of presentations like Prezi was sort of uh, uh, difficult to take to some of the older learners. I think if you were going to anticipate that, that probably would not be your best platform. Uh, again, if you think you're going to engage an audience who probably won't won't, won't have you know a mobile device, then again, audience respond. Remember, technology is again it's just a tool. You know, raising your hand is a way for engagement of the audience and stuff like that. So, would are you asking me would I be concerned or avoid using technology in order learners? I probably would not. It probably would be again in the beginning. You'd probably have to do an assessment. Again, if you're anticipating that of what their comfort level is, so how do you do that? Well, again, I, you know, I could very easily just put up, you know, a poll or something like that and see how many people actually participate. If it, if you get low participation, drop it, and then just use your backup. I, I think, you know, there is a nimbleness that's required whenever you're a lecturer in terms of setting, in terms of audience, and that sort of thing. So I, I think, you know, we're pretty smart enough to kind of read read people after a few minutes, and I think. Th Anticipating that, make sure that you know you're not going to bias someone or that sort of thing. I don't know if that answers your question. No, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I, if not everyone raised their hand in that first question, I'd be in big trouble. I think that question alone, like if no one raised, like a lot of people raised their hand, I'd be like, okay, well we're going to skip that part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Last question. Last question. If not, then I'll just one final word. I think what you have emphasized today is that um, 
delivering a presentation is hard work. And there requires preparation, anticipation, understanding your audience, defining what is the best tool to reach them and so forth. And to be an educator, you've got to take advantage of these, uh, or you should take advantage of these technologies, but it's not just about standing up in front of the audience and assuming that everything will flow fine. There's a lot of work involved. You certainly had a lot of work involved here, and we really appreciate it. All right, thanks, Jesse. It was a pleasure. Thank really you. Fun. Of course.